I start with asking questions about carbon budget and OECD versus non-OECD energy consumption and such. And I know that you have written a cubic mile of oil. So you are pretty familiar with those things, I presume. Yeah, I don't know that I can recall them off the top of my head all the time. Okay, climate change. It's happening. It's real. As far as I'm concerned, it seems all the pointers are towards it. We have been burning carbon and putting carbon dioxide into the air. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. When you put greenhouse gas, it's like putting a blanket over yourself. No surprise, it's going to get warmer. And it is getting warmer. But you've got to be quantitative, how much in this and that. And it has taken a good 20, 30 years of good solid research. But all that the research has proved kind of is they have tightened the range of uncertainties. But the fact that carbon dioxide levels have increased is incontrovertible. Global average temperatures have increased. That's pretty incontrovertible. The ice coverage of the Antarctic and Arctic are changing. Arctic said really it's in summer, it's almost disappearing. Incontrovertible evidence. Question really that comes up and I see that is, why do some people not believe in it? And I think many people do believe that it's happening, but what comes out is there is a, a disconnect, cognitive dissonance that comes up. I think a lot of it happens because the solutions that people offer, if they are not aligned with what they're thinking, they just say, well, everything is wrong. It's a hypothesis, it's a theory, it's, I don't believe it. The, the budget is already exceeded, so we're about 1,800 years behind. The uh, ability of the planet to sequester carbon dioxide uh, permanently, which is done by the ocean. Life that calcifies has shells, skeletons, and when they die, they take the carbonate that they've made to the ocean floor, and there it sits. Sediment becomes limestone, maybe, and, uh, and so that's what we depend upon for the ocean chemistry to be stable. Uh, we're screwing that up at the rate of about 10 billion tons per year of CO2 into the ocean. People don't really hear about much the ocean problems because people are always talking about global warming or climate change, which is part of the problem, but it's nowhere near the whole problem. About 15% of human food protein comes from the ocean, ocean life, and the major food chains are dependent upon the uh, organisms at the base of the food chain tiny, tiny organisms that have shells or skeletons. And if they can't make their shells or skeletons because the chemistry of the ocean is ruined by our carbon dioxide dissolution, uh, then that collapses the entire food chain up through whales. So if you like whales, you will not like ocean acidification. So in normal times, the ocean chemistry is buffered by interaction between the seawater and the sediments. But it takes around a thousand years for the oceans to turn over and it takes maybe 6,000 years or something like that before the water all interacts with the sediments. And so in normal geologic time, when CO2 was coming out of volcanoes slowly, it had, the system had enough time to equilibrate and buffer ocean chemistry. But when we're putting out all the CO2 over years and decades and maybe a couple of centuries, that it's just too fast for the ocean water, all of that to come in contact with the sediments. And so we're seeing changes in ocean chemistry 
that are more extreme than any in many tens of millions of years. And the only time that these kinds of chemistry changes happened in the past, they've been associated with mass extinction events in the ocean. And so we're really conducting a, a radical experiment. We are pretty sure that coral reefs will disappear, but uh, it's a lot harder to predict what will happen to other ecosystems. But the thinking is that, that a lot of ecosystems will be seriously impacted. The, the biggest influence on people this century, I think, is going to happen if heat stress in the tropics causes crops to fail. And there's a potential for widespread famines and mass migrations and wars and all of this kind of thing. And so uh, really more than the direct effects of climate change itself, I'm really afraid of the kind of social upheaval that could come if, if there's massive crop failure in the tropics due to heat stress. So we were talking some unintended consequences or some things that can happen. Uh, one of them was what, like the Green Revolution in India when I was growing up. Uh, food shortage was a big, big, big problem. India was not producing adequate amount. And by the use of certain hybrid grains and all that, uh, productivity was increased and Indian farmers uh, started to do much, much better and India became self-sufficient and a net exporter of food grains. But uh, lately what has been happening is that that big rise, you know, which was uh, the increase that happened in productivity also had its consequences in terms of depleting the soil quality and water availability. The water table in many areas has now gone so far down that the farmers are having a hard time maintaining productivity and some of them have taken loans etc to make sure that they can uh, survive or kind of produce in the next season but if their crops are not fail are not uh, forming and not being produced crop failure as we talk about partly because of climate change not lack of uh, the changing weather patterns and changing seasons and things like that uh, it's putting a tremendous hardship on farmers and uh, there have been way too many reports of uh, suicides among the farmers who couldn't pay their debts and, and that's really unfortunate. And it started being a very benign thing, a green revolution, but then if you go too fast, and you deplete some of the resources and you come up against other limits to growth. And this is what, what's happening over there right now. Here in California, Climate change is impacting our water supply a lot. Drought has been a thing here um, since the beginning of time, but it's becoming more and more and more frequent now as the climate changes. I think a lot of processes have been set in motion that'll take a lot of like the opposite of what we've been doing so far in order to actually stop or turn around, but I think we can definitely slow it by um, decarbonizing our electricity and transportation sectors, trying to slow down emissions, and um, it's a big ask, it's a big haul, but um, we got to try. You know, we talk about the need to reduce carbon emissions by mid-century, by 2050, and it can seem a little abstract, a little remote, like these long timescales, but I realized recently that my daughter will be uh, the age that I am now in 2050. For all of the climate talks through the years, you know, it's been the environment ministers who show up at those talks and, you know, think, oh, what should we do about this? But actually, this is about risk. It's about conflict. It's about food security. Um, it's about the, you know, resilience of our infrastructure um, and the disruption that we're already seeing being caused, not just in Bangladesh and India, but in France, in Texas, you know. This, these are real impacts on people's lives, on their homes, on public health. This is a public health issue. So yeah, I'm pretty worried about climate change. OECD people, which means us and Europeans and other people in countries that are more or less, more or less affluent compared to the average member of the world population. Uh, we use a considerable amount of energy every 
day. Uh, a typical house in the Western world consumes at least 1,000 watts, maybe 1,500 watts, every hour of every day. So that's you know 24 to 30 kilowatt hours for every home each day. So that's the basic energy production that's needed to sustain an OECD lifestyle. And of course, people in poor areas like Africa, India, and other places where they have huge populations, but they don't have that much energy production, well, those, those people are at a disadvantage, both from their personal ability to have energy for cooking, heating, cooling, uh, refrigeration, and uh, you know gimmicks like phones, and <laughs> cell phones, and so forth. But that's only part of the problem. The main problem is that they don't really have enough energy production to run uh, businesses, industry, and so forth that could employ large numbers of people in poor countries like that. So that's the, the problem. How, are we, how do we generate new energy that has never been generated before to bring these people up to some fraction of an OECD person's uh, life? I think the problem is that the average person, particularly even in an OECD country, uh, doesn't really get the information that they need from the media. And as a result of that, they don't realize that electricity, clean electricity, uh, is, is just like clean water or clean air or sanitary sewage systems or fire departments or police departments. It's a utility until you have to actually decide to build a system that can be as reliable as your water supply. In, a, in an OECD country or your sewer systems in, the, in that country. And that's something that you can't do with intermittent things like wind and solar. It's something that you can only do reliable 24-7 power sources that are clean, like hydro, geothermal, and nuclear power. We had a meeting recently with a bunch of development experts along with climate and energy experts, and it was really about how to think about this development and climate problem collectively. And it was a real eye-opener for some of the climate people to listen to some of the development people, because if you're in dire poverty and you don't have any electricity and you don't have access to the internet and you don't have all of this kind of things, what you want is access to these energy services and you want them as quickly as possible and you want them as cheaply as possible and if some rich academics from Stanford say oh you can't burn that lump of coal because you know that will affect the climate of people in a hundred years that they're not going to be very responsive to that message and so you know so even putting up Side the question of whether impoverished people should be asked to sacrifice their personal well-being to help you know future generations around the world. That I think that just the reality is that it's in their interest to develop as rapidly as possible using as cheap energy as they can get and. You know, as we've seen in South Africa, where they recently built two five gigawatt coal plants, that in other places natural gas is the cheapest. But uh, in most settings where reliable energy is needed, that it's fossil fuels that's supplying that. It's not like uh, the difference between a rich person and a poor person is not a factor of two or something like this. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but you know, factor of a hundred is not uncommon for a rich person relative to a poor person in terms of emissions. And, and so the emissions from Africa and Asia could be really huge. And we don't have any moral authority to tell people you have to stay in poverty because of the climate issue. And so this meeting that was on climate versus development, it more or less turned into, look, we're going to develop, and if you people in the rich countries want to deal with the climate problem, well, give us some cheap technology that we can put in, but we're not going to spend lots of money to solve what we see as a first world problem. I mean, many of the poorest countries in the world see themselves as a victim, and rightly, rightly so, 
of emissions put out by the richest countries. And they said, well, look, you rich countries, if you want to solve this problem, give us the money or give us the technology that will let us solve it. I'm speaking as a U.S. scientist, a scientist who has been in the U.S. for all his career. People would regard you as being part of the fossil fuel industry, right? Before Absolutely. So when I started my career here in the U.S., close to 40 years ago, uh, the big challenge at that time was uh, liquid hydrocarbons were what we were sh running short of. We were at the mercy, we meaning the U.S., was at the mercy of OPEC countries uh, supplying us with liquid fuels which we use for our cars and planes and factories and heating and all kinds of things, the oil. And that was in short supply. The U.S. had large uh, supplies and quantity reserves of coal. But coal doesn't run these things and coal is not a liquid. So the challenge for a hydrocarbon chemist like me was take coal and convert it into a petroleum-like liquid. And that's what we were working on and we worked and that was, if nothing else, it was too expensive, but at least it became a cap for the price as to how much the OPEC could raise. Because if they raised the price more than that, we could pro potentially convert, start converting coal into liquid. So there's that. That was the benefit. But as I was working on it, it became clear that we are having another problem, which is the uh, atmospheric, <laughs> what we are putting up in the atmosphere uh, affects our climate affects us and global warming and sea, rise, sea level changing and all those things. At the same time, I recall that you know, I had a very personal experience also with poverty. I mean, I grew up in Calcutta. I have seen what poverty is and what destitute is and how not having enough energy to produce clean water, food and things really can affect. And it takes energy to lift people out of poverty. So on the one hand, we don't want to be using our hydrocarbon fuels, but that is the fuel that the world is using as a, as a whole, even in India. In fact, when we stopped burning coal inside the house for cooking and got gas to LPG kind of things, or when there was electricity available on a full-time basis rather than intermittent basis, it improved the quality of life considerably. And even if that electricity at that time was being produced by coal, well, that was a far cry better than not having it. So there is this tension between um, using the fossil energy, the coal, the oil, the gas that we have, to produce the energy and, and allowing people to improve their lot in life, versus um, uh, not keeping all of it in ground, as some people would suggest, keep it in the ground because we cannot afford to put any more in the air. Well, that would be true if we could give them commensurate quantities of energy from other sources. You know, population has always been like the third rail of climate in that people don't like to talk about population growth as a driver of climate change. And it is true that, you know, rich people can emit a hundred times more CO2 than a poor person. And so uh, you should say, well, look, it's really the state of development that counts and not the number of people. But, you know, the usual way the calculations are done, it's number of people times per capita uh, G GDP and so on and so if there's twice as many people other things equal there'll be twice as much emissions and so uh, you know I think population is something that needs to get looked at and and I, I think the big concern is really with Africa and uh, that population projections are for Africa to have 4 billion people by the end of the century and uh, we've looked into this question. Uh, so the poorest people have the highest fertility rates because they, you know, a number of reasons of not depending, you know, not sure their children will survive, lack of pensions, and so on. And so we had this question of, okay, if you made, if you help the poor people become richer, that would tend to slow their population growth rates, but then would increase their emissions, and would then actually decrease emissions over the long run? And the answer is no, basically, that 
you know, because if you make people richer, you maybe increase their emissions by a factor of 10, you decrease their population size by a factor of two, and you end up with more emissions. I'm all for making, helping the poorest people to be richer, and that will slow population growth, but it's going to lead to net increase in emissions. And so I think this is one of the fundamental issues that social justice with today's energy technologies that we're deploying today means increasing emissions because poor people have a right to not be in poverty. And, uh, you know, and so if there could be cheap, you know, abundant nuclear power plants coming off of the end of, of, assembly, of factories that could be ready to be deployed in places that are energy starved today, it would be great. As things stand at the moment, it's difficult. I mean, firstly, I can't see why we would want to go there. The environmental damage caused by renewables is enormous. It, it seems to me self-evident that if we go back towards relying on the moment-by-moment -moment actions of nature for our energy and we, we rape the natural world of that energy, uh, then the environmental damage we're going to cause is vastly more than if we use concentrated forms of fuel, maybe even fossil fuels, although the, the climate implications are horrendous, but certainly when we have available uh, low carbon, very concentrated source of energy, mainly uh, the various forms of nuclear energy, uh, then I can't see why you'd want to do it. But even if you decided for some reason that you were prepared to pay that environmental cost, uh, not just in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, but the amount of material you use, the difficulty with renewables remains that matching up supply and demand is extremely difficult. We have plenty of evidence, for example, from uh, California now, which has an awful lot of solar capacity, that because all of your solar power comes at the same time, during the day and around the middle of the day, uh, then you have two problems. Firstly, what you do for energy overnight, and in the, you know, California is a rather warmer place than the United Kingdom generally, but in the UK our peak electricity demand is on a cold winter's night when solar is of no use. But increasingly uh, difficult is what do you do when solar is generating too much and we're seeing in California and in Germany and many other places that the more renewables you get the more they cannibalize themselves. They generate electricity at a time when you don't need electricity because they're already generating. So increasingly when you add an extra unit of, of, of solar at a certain point, that is simply competing with already existing solar, it's not competing with anything else. And so you have these three problems, firstly what do you do when the renewables aren't generating enough, secondly what do you do when they are generating too much, and thirdly what you do in between the two when very very rapidly the output from uh, solar or particularly wind is changing, uh, you can very easily you have a change of 60% of your rated capacity from wind within an hour. Uh, how do you manage the stability of the system when you're having to respond to those changes in supply with some kind of other, other kit? So as it stands, it seems to me it is neither desirable nor does it look terribly uh, uh, feasible that we should move towards anything like 100% uh, renewables. The one thing that might change matters is storage, but storage itself has massive environmental costs. The materials we're using, the lithiums and, and the like, are pretty unpleasant to, to get at and to, and to uh, use. Uh, and in any case, you're constantly battling against the second law of thermodynamics. You don't get anything for free in energy. And storage is never going to be more than, you might get up to 80, 85% efficiency, but at the cost of either using vast amounts of land for hydro storage or vast amounts of material for battery storage with relatively short lives. So I don't, yeah, the 100% renewable seems to me to be uh, both a chimera, but also one that doesn't, even if it worked, would not deliver the kind of environment that we'd want to do it. First of all, there's no such thing as renewable energy. It's a marketing term. They're trying to sell stuff. Sounds good. But if you go back to your high school science class and you read, open the book and you go to energy, you'll read the principle of conservation of energy. And that says that universal principle has been known for hundreds of years. And it says <clears throat> energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. So we can put electri electricity into an oven and it generates heat energy. We can 
make transformations of energy, but we cannot, in fact, renew it. It doesn't, we don't get any more than is inherent in the material and the system, the uh, natural systems that we have. So that's the first fallacy that people have to actually understand is a marketing effort to sell a particular product. And the particular products that are being sold now are solar power generation and wind power generation. Uh, obviously, the sun produces energy continually, all the time. Uh, we intercept a little bit of it on Earth. Our solar panels at most could give us a thousand watts of power per square meter. So since a house is about a thousand to fifteen hundred watts, you could maybe have uh, several square, a few square meters of perfectly efficient solar panels to run your house. Well, that would be fine, but solar panels are not efficient because the product is not a fully engineered device. It's, it, there's many more improvements that have to be made to solar uh, photovoltaics before they actually generate much of the energy that the sun gives us. So that doesn't really work because we don't really have a product on the sun side, on the sun energy side. On the wind energy side, wind is solar energy that's second order. It's the result of the sun heating up the atmosphere and the land and the oceans. Uh, and so it's even less reliable than solar energy. And how we harvest the motion of the wind is very important in terms of how efficient, how much material we have to expend, how much steel, how much concrete, how much of everything we have to expend on a wind machine to capture energy from the moving air. And it turns out that propeller, which is what's used in typical wind machines, is one of the least efficient ways of gathering energy from moving air. So why build something like that? Uh, in particular because it consumes thousands of tons of material per windmill just to make steel, make concrete, copper for the generator, all this kind of stuff. So it, and it, it doesn't really survive in hurricanes. It doesn't really, uh, it's unpredictable in the sense of when the wind is going to be strong enough to actually generate enough power. So this whole idea of taking easily accessible wind and eas easily accessible solar power and trying to power the world with it doesn't make any sense. As I said before, you know, you can take a solar panel, and give it to a, a family that has no connection to any electrical grid in some poorer region of the world and give them a battery, a solar panel and a charging unit and a little a light and they can have something to keep their house lit at night and let their kid do his homework. So the 100% renewables idea, it's a really seductive vision for transforming our society. And it has this great benefit of mobilizing a lot of people around an ambitious goal, like a big, hairy, audacious goal. And I see the, the value in that. The problem is, is that when you start to really crunch the numbers and you look at the carbon intensity of the overall system, what we found in, we did a, we did a study um, called the Climate Leadership Report last year, which um, showed that there really is no correlation between high percentage of installed capacity of renewables and low carbon intensity. And actually, when it comes to climate, really the only thing that matters is low carbon intensity. So how do we marry that reality with the vision, the goal? Well, you know, the, the, we have to understand why it is that the 100% renewables vision is so seductive. And I think a big part of the reason for that is not to do with the attributes of the technology themselves, but the values that they represent. And those values are things like being closer to nature, being human scale, being more democratic, being like drawing on the you know in, infinite resources from nature. Um, and those things really appeal to people. And actually people like being a bit more in control and having a bit more direct contact with their energy supply, which in the past has been you know, run by big, remote, faceless corporations. So the challenge I think for us is that we have to broaden the suite of solutions that sit within that value proposition. And I really think that we can do that 
we can actually, and that's what's one of the things that's really appealing about the industrial transformation that we're trying to mobilize in the nuclear sector, you know, because actually it's about these organizations behaving differently, speaking to those values that people care about. Um, you know, I'd like to see a cooperatively owned nuclear power station. Why not? My view of Germany for a long time has been that they are the uh, crucible, they're the experimental laboratory for the, uh, I, I would say, the renewable fanatics, those who believe that, uh, against all the evidence, that renewables can, can, can uh, supply more. We need, in my view, there will always be that hanging around, that uh, I think it's a myth, I might be wrong, that it might be deliverable, that we can do it all with renewables. And having, you know, if it doesn't do that in Germany, a, a rich country, a country which can dump the negative effects of any vendor on its neighbours, because it can dump excess electricity supply on, it's got something like 17 gigawatts of intercapacity, probably more now. Uh, so it was able to just dump toxic overproduction of electricity on its neighbours and outbid its neighbours when it needs uh, input. So it was, uh, as the dominant economic power in the area, it was able to uh, defray many of the disadvantages onto its uh, less uh, less affluent neighbours. Uh, then, uh, and of course, a great deal of political commitment to it as well. If it doesn't work in Germany, it's not going to work. Uh, and what we know so far from the first uh, uh, eight years of it is that greenhouse gas emissions have gone up. They've got to mine more brown coal. They're destroying villages. They're destroying woods. They're destroying cathedrals uh, to make way for the new fossil fuels uh, that, that they need. They've put pressure on Vattenfall, the Swedish company, uh, threatened them with all sorts of things if they don't go ahead and continue to mine more brown coal and, and set up more brown, brown coal mines. Uh, and so, you know, on the face of it, you just say Germany is the environmental vandal of, of Europe, and it has been for many years. Uh, but I think we can look at it more positively than that. There are some very good people in Germany who I admire hugely, who are beginning to put the pro-nuclear case out there again. We saw the uh, the uh, Nuclear Pride uh, Festival uh, at the end of uh, October, uh, and I admire them hugely. But the way it seems to me, it's unlikely that the German government is going to turn around on that. So let's make sure that we've got all the metrics in place, let's sure that we measure Germany properly. Uh, because if, as I suspect, the outcome from Germany will be, if you really, really try hard, you can replace a little bit of fossil fuel with renewables, but actually not terribly much. Uh, and that's outweighed by what you lose by, by moving away from nuclear. That will be an extremely valuable message. I think an awful lot of people around the world are getting that message already. Many countries are looking at Germany and thinking that, uh, you know, quite apart from the cost, you know, the, an extra million people in fuel poverty because of these costs, this complete fiction that renewables are uh, cheap just because their levelized cost is falling, which ignores the, what you have to do, uh, the, the points I was uh, talking about as to how you manage the variability. Um, all those myths, I think, are coming home to roost now. It's the greatest service that Germany can pay at this moment, is making it clear to the world that even if you are fanatics for renewables, even if for whatever party political advantage and fear of, of the Green Party in particular, you sail your country down the river on this, uh, it still doesn't work, uh, and therefore maybe we have to think again. Yeah, um, a lot of people, they like to talk about how urgent climate change is and that we have to take action right now, we have to reduce emissions right now. And that's a narrative I actually believe in. Um, and I wonder if everyone who's saying that actually believes what they're saying. Because if they did believe that, they would not want to shut down any existing source of emission-free electricity. So our nuclear plants around the country and around the world that are at threat of premature closure, um, they're being replaced by fossil fuels. And people might want them to be replaced by renewables. Number one, it's just not happening. And number two, even if it could happen, why would you want to replace one clean energy source with another clean energy source? We should be putting all of our energy into replacing fossil fuels. It's only a few percent of the electricity, and if I look at it on the global scale, we are still about, uh, you know, we have to grow the wind and solar by what, a factor of a few hundred or a thousand times before it, it's, it can deliver what's needed. And if I look at what 
do we have the supply chains for um, those materials? Even if we are not going to really run out, I'm not looking at just the reserves, but if I can look at the total endowment also, uh, total resource base that we have, we may have that, but we don't have the supply chain. It strains even the steel and aluminum and copper things, you know, we have to double or triple those or concrete. These industries cannot be just, they're, they're huge industries and we will have to double or triple those. So it takes time. So I don't think they can, the, all renewables will get it fast enough. In the meantime, what is that people are going to continue to suffer. And if I want to alleviate that, I, I think we need to, to embrace nuclear and start doing it real quick, or we'll be burning a lot more coal and oil. 100% renewable strategies are very popular. And to a lot of people, they sound like the obvious solution. Like, why don't we just do them right now? What's standing in our way? And we're being told in, um, you know, the popular narrative is that we just lack the political will to, to go 100% renewable. That's the only thing standing in our way. But a lot of people don't know that there are real technical barriers um, and birds. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people don't know there are real barriers to going 100% renewable, and they, don't, they haven't been told the real environmental cost of what that would mean. The land that we would cover, um, all of the mining that would be required for all the raw materials, um, you know, the bird deaths, the um, desert tortoises, all sorts of different impacts that we don't think about. Yeah, so every energy supply has impacts, and we have to look at all of them we have to look at what we care about whether it be the open space or emissions or whatever and um, the problem with the 100 percent renewable strategy is it leaves out a couple of really good options yeah so yeah. why do that <laughs> why limit ourselves over and over again when people shut down nuclear power plants that power is predominantly replaced by fossil fuels, coal, and in some cases natural gas. And in almost every case where nuclear power plants have been shut down, if not every case, carbon dioxide emissions have gone up. Those are things that people don't necessarily hear about, but that's reality. The fact is that every time you add a nuclear plant in a country that's been using combustion fuels, you reduce the pollution. Because of the technology involved in nuclear plant construction and operation, your worker force is actually much better prepared, therefore has had more education, college level typically, uh, gets better pay, uh, has, has a relatively stable environment in which to, to work and, and live, and so the the benefit to the community of the nuclear plant is not just clean energy and reliable energy that's now available 90% of the time. It's uh, an overall social benefit. For instance, the plant, Diablo Canyon plant in California, puts about a billion dollars a year into the local county economy. What you have is, a, is, a, is actually strengthening a society based on a technology that has been chosen because it does the job that we want. It produces utility grade electricity. It's available pretty much all the time, cleanly, and it provides opportunities for, for jobs and so forth that are, uh, are not matched in, in other, uh, in, certainly in the renewables industry, not matched there. We knew that um Conventional gigawatt scale nuclear power stations, just standard nuclear power stations, are being built today for half or even a third of the cost that we're seeing in the US and in Europe. And we wanted to understand why that was. And the kind of, you know, to test some assumptions like, oh, well, labor is cheap in China and maybe they're cutting corners on safety. You know, these are some of the assumptions that kind of show up when you think, why is it so much cheaper? to deliver nuclear power stations in China and Korea, in Russia and Japan. Um, and so our study basically investigated that. And um, what we found was that um, it's less about the actual nuclear island itself, 
so the complicated nuclear kettle, essentially. Um, you can build an AP-1000 in China and an AP-1000 in the US, and the actual nuclear bit will cost the same pretty much wherever you build it. But what the real difference is, is in what's called the balance of plant. And that's essentially the, the project management, the construction execution, um, you know, the time spent interacting with regulators and fiddling about with the design and you know, all of those indirect costs essentially get really amplified in the US and in Europe today. Now, um, what, we, what we found interestingly was that in China, for example, they didn't start out cheap. The, the very early Chinese plants that were built back in, you know, the sort of late 70s, early 80s, were, were fairly, you know, similar to the kinds of costs that we were seeing being delivered in the US and in Europe. But what they did was they um, had a very, like, ruthless focus on cost reduction and performance improvement. And they built the same thing over and over again. And each time they built a unit, they took a step back and they said, what did we learn? How can we do it better next time? And guess what? Here we are, you know, a few decades later, and they're really, really good at it. And those plants are being delivered at a cost which is competitive, even with fossil fuels today. So the lesson I think for Europe and, and the US is that we have to sort of, first of all, make an honest appraisal of where we are. So we haven't built a major piece of infrastructure like that for a really long time, you know, for decades in, in the UK. So we're right at the beginning. And if we acknowledge that from the, from the start and don't, you know, um, judge too harshly the cost outcome from that very first unit that we build, but we make a very intentional decision to learn from that unit, then we could very rapidly see some very meaningful cost reduction to a level which I think would be publicly much more acceptable and ultimately the real goal is to make nuclear investable. And it does seem to me that the Chinese are rather better at doing it than, than the West is now. We've seen this with the EPR projects uh, at, uh, in, in, in China, uh, Qinchan is, is, yeah, has become the first EPR to be operating, although it was construction began significantly after uh, also, I say three or Flammenville three. Um, so we have a lot to learn from the Chinese now. There, the, the the guys with the with the finger on or the guys and girls with the fingers on the on the pulse. South Korea for many years has been an absolute model. Japan uh, has a very good record of bringing plants into time and cost. Clearly, uh, after Fukushima, the things have changed. There, they're beginning to seriously dip their foot back into the nuclear water but it may be a little bit of time before they re-establish themselves on the construction uh, front in Japan uh, but that is where we're seeing and that of course is consistent with where the economic growth of the world has been. The world has shown that it can do nuclear extremely quickly if it needs to and uh, Sweden in particular but France and many other countries uh, installed extraordinary amounts of nuclear per capita for their for their uh, population far quicker than we've ever managed to do with with renewables uh, and so if the world decided uh, that they wanted to do this we probably need to find some sort of hybrid between generations two and three my own view is that because of a completely uh, 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 ill-conceived over-the-top obsession with so-called safety based on generation two which has proved to be very workable and very safe um, we ended up with nuclear innovation, in effect, being aimed to improve these theoretical safety uh, issues rather than to reduce costs, which is what most uh, technical innovation rightly is aimed towards. So we've ended up with some extremely expensive uh, plants at the moment. So I personally would like to see us go to the stage where we know works and we know can really deliver significant improvements to the environment. I mean, it's just remarkable that uh, Chernobyl 4 went up in 1986. They still operated plants on the site uh, and until the 21st century. Uh, Unit 2 had a roof fire that closed it down. Uh, the other ones, including Unit 3, which was semi-detached with Unit 4 and shared a wall with the stricken reactor, were still operating uh, up to 2000. And Fukushima has, has offered us some very stark, very tragic, but very clear lessons, 
which broadly is that radiation is pretty benign, but radiological protection is lethal. That over 2,000 people have been killed because of the, of the response to Fukushima. Nobody has died as a result of the radiation. And yeah, I mean, saying that, it doesn't have to be nobody. This would still be a very good deal if, if uh, given the, uh, the, the lives that it saves. But the remarkable thing is that uh, nobody has died as a result of the radiation. It's very unlikely that anybody will, or at least that we'll be able to tell if anybody has died against the background uh, uh, levels of diseases that we're talking about. So we need to recast the question about how do we stop Fukushima happening again. What that really means to me is, next time there is a major release of radioactivity from a nuclear power station, or another source, but basically a nuclear power station, how do we make sure that we don't turn that annoying middle-ranking industrial mishap, which Fukushima was, into a very significant human tragedy. Uh, and if we can recast, and that's the real question in my mind, if we recast the question about safety around that, how do we stop ourselves killing an awful lot of people and destroying an awful lot of lives for no reason at all, or for hardly any reason? Uh, then there's a chance we're getting the whole debate onto the right footing, which is here we have a source of energy with massive potential for good, both in terms of reducing the geopolitical pressure on fossil fuels, in terms of reliability of supply, in terms of it not devastating huge areas of land to create wind farms or, or solar panels, uh, of producing very, very little toxic waste compared to solar energy or to, uh, or, or certainly to the fossil fuels. Uh, and being a downward pressure on prices, as well as the massive bonus of, of, of greenhouse gas reduction. You have a massive number of benefits around this that we're missing out on at the moment because we have failed to take into account the good common sense of people uh, who will actually recognise there are downsides to any industrial process. But if you don't come and tell me you're really dangerous by coming and telling me what you intend to do with the waste way over the top, or that we need to do this to keep you safe and so on. As long as you don't do that, as long as you treat us like grown-ups, we will behave like grown-ups, because actually people don't want the environment to be destroyed. And uh, if those suspicions are not raised by, by an industry that just doesn't understand human psychology sometimes, and mistakes technical rationality for human rationality, then I think that the ship can turn around, and I think it's beginning to, as I say. I think there are many countries now where this message is getting across, and nuclear is being seen as a positive thing, not the old argument was that the reason you support nuclear is it's not quite as bad as you thought it was. Now going towards, now actually the reason you support nuclear is it's a heck of a lot better than any of the alternatives, and that includes renewables. Now, there are PR arguments going on as to whether we should, uh, whether people should, uh, uh, in the nuclear industry should oppose renewables. What about waste? What about the accidents and uh, all that? That comes up whenever I talk about this. Oh, if I look at waste part, this is at least a solid pellet that's inside a steel tube, which is inside a concrete. It is not being dispersed all over the en uh, environment. So it's there, it's under control. And once it's in those dry casks, those concrete dry casks, I can walk up to it. It's not like it's going to kill me. It's also, it's not waste. It's a resource for the next generation of breeder reactors. So don't bury it away. But if you have to, actually, technically, I don't see there are problems or any challenges in it, in, the, in storage. Because all the storage of all the last 70 years of nuclear power production would be, is what they say, 20,000 cubic meters is the number that was in the book. And I said, well, what is that? Let me go back to my football field, for example. And so that's about 13 feet deep, one football field. Takes care of 70 years of nuclear waste. That's all. Yeah, I mean, if you're not reprocessing it, and spent nuclear fuel clearly does contain a lot of uh, uh, potential energy that could be, then I'm presumably in the future the techniques will have emerged that will deal with it more uh, rapidly. So so that's why I say the idea of burying it deep underground doesn't seem to me to be sensible. Shallow storage where you could retrieve it if you wanted to. 
My instincts are that there's plenty of thermal uranium around for an awful long time, and therefore the economics would have to shift quite a long way before plutonium became economically attractive. But in terms of a resource, it increases the uranium reserve by something like a factor of 50 or 60. Uh, and if we were really powering ahead with nuclear, to the extent that we began to find we were the ores that we were finding were more and more dilute, then being able to get at the few previous spent fuel are already reactor systems that can run on spent fuel to, to an extent. So from that point of view, fine. And maybe then, yeah, as has been the case in the UK, we don't call spent fuel waste. Uh, waste is what's left after reprocessing the spent fuel and the, the vitrified high-level stuff. Uh, we've moved away from reprocessing as a world because we don't need it, and there's, uh, there's arguments for that. But uh, spent fuel isn't really waste in my view, but if we regard it as waste, it, it just, just treat it normally. The other thing that people probably don't hear much about is that nuclear power plants provide the only convenient mechanism for destroying nuclear weapons. And during the megatons to megawatts agreement with Russia, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, we, just, we took 17,000 Russian warheads and used them to generate power in our nuclear plants in the United States. And for a time it was generating 10% of the power that, that the nuclear plants were generating in the United States. In terms of actual human health, James Hansen did a study some years ago suggesting that so far over a million lives have been saved by nuclear. As he rightly said in that, it's so dependent on what you put into, what assumptions you make, uh, that I don't think he or anyone would say that's a firm figure. But nonetheless, it is blatantly the case that using nuclear rather than certainly any of the fossil fuels uh, saves lives. But frankly, the main issues around uh, human security at the moment are not so much in the day-to-day -day health risks of energy, which all have. You get people, you know, there was a very important incident in Brazil, if I remember rightly, of a, of a just of a, of a lorry carrying wind blades, which overturned and killed nine people, I think. I mean, right the way through your cycle, you're going to get terrible, unfortunate accidents like, uh, like that. It, it's more the what's happened in terms of saving something of the order of two billion tonnes of carbon dioxide every year. Uh, as, as a contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In a country like the UK, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions would be somewhere around 6 to 12% greater than they are, depending on whether you were using gas or coal as the, as the alternative. Historically, it would have been coal, uh, more likely to be gas in the future. But, you know, not the be-all and end-all, but a very valuable contribution to reducing that. Because of Diablo Canyon um, being built close to several seismic faults, the interest in the seismicity of the region has spurred a lot of um, a lot of investment in research. And so we have thriving university programs that have benefited from that research, and a lot of professional societies that benefit from that research as well. I got a degree in engineering, and I happened on a job at Diablo Canyon Power Plant because I wanted to stay in this area. And when I got there, I met some of the most educated, most incredible people that I've ever met in my life. I was not expecting that at all. And, um, and I ended up learning a lot about um, their different fields and about some of the positive impacts that nuclear has on our society that I had no idea about before. Like some of these incredibly smart scientists are there employed by the power plant or by the companies that own the power plants and they're doing groundbreaking research such as in the field of seismic engineering and um, our world is better for that you know the more we know the more we're able to improve our designs and save lives around the world one of the heather said um, that the plant being big is what excited her and <laughs> it, that is exciting about it but another exciting thing about um, a nuclear power plant is how small it is compared yeah. to how much energy it produces. So when I learned that Diablo Canyon produced over 20% of California's clean energy on just a few acres of land, I mean, that was incredibly exciting. And I think that's what started really, you know, pulling me back day after day was thinking about what a great thing I was doing um, in terms of conserving land and natural resources for us to use on other things like hiking and enjoying them instead of um, bulldozing them and you know paving them over or putting up 
um, things that take up a lot more land. The current fleet of nuclear power, the light water reactors, is very safe and very good. And can, we can really afford to increase the fleet you know, several fold without running into real shortages of, of anything. The good thing is that they are being deployed in some other countries. And even newer technologies, the Gen 3s and Gen 4s, are being developed and experimented in Korea, in France, in India, in China. And they're going to be taking the lead now because I think the U.S. Is going, is, has basically taken a backseat and is going to cede the technology advantage. That. And then maybe in 10 years we'll be buying the technology back from them. Yeah, I'd love to see nuclear power plants rolling off a factory in a very um, you know, low cost mass production kind of mode and, and bring down the cost that way. And so, yeah, I guess I would like to see passively safe reactors that are coming off assembly lines at low cost. That, that you know, the, the power demand in this planet this century is going to be huge. And we need something that's simple and reproducible and you know, something that we construct at huge scale and that can more or less go in anywhere. And, uh, you know, nuclear is one of the few things that can do that. The Canadian nuclear uh, regulatory agencies are much better to deal with than the U.S. NRC. Uh, that's why a company like Terrestrial Energy is in Toronto is working with uh, their regulator to produce the, their molten salt reactor design. It's really a political matter in the United States as to whether or not we really want to get serious about reducing emissions and, uh, and increasing nuclear power deployments. I mean, we can do it. The nice thing about a nuclear plant is that they're, it, it's really just making heat from nuclear fission and uh, decay of the fission products that are, occur in the reactor core. Uh, so whatever source of heat you want that you think is best at the time, you can put into the plant. It doesn't have to be the current kind of nuclear uh, generation. It could be in the future, it could be molten salt, it could be something else. But the site is there. The site has a huge amount of other equipment and investment, and the site has a via and access to the electrical grid. That's a very important thing. A lot of people don't want to have an electrical, uh, high, high voltage electrical path run through their, their county or their town. So you've already got it. Don't waste it. So either build the plant, or if you don't like the way the nuclear uh, heat is generated, pick a different design for the heat. But the whole plant itself is a valuable asset regardless of whether or not it's nuclear. Right. I mean, we want it to be nuclear, but the point is that this argument about nuclear plants being expensive is ridiculous because the basic part of the plant lasts for 100 years or more. There's no, there's nothing to replace. I mean, you can replace parts, but there's nothing, there's nothing to deteriorate in terms of the overall structure, the, the base of the plant, uh, the concrete, uh, the, the electrical uh, via and so forth. So it's, well, the point is just that it's modular. You can think of a nuclear plant as a modular source of clean electricity. So you can go in and displace modules, change them out, do that sort of thing. You don't, you don't want to get rid of a nuclear site. You want to actually finish it, operate it. And that's what the, you know, BC summer thing, unfortunately, is it, it needs that kind of thinking because it would benefit our whole country. If you want, I mean, I can go back to the original impetus in the United States, which was President Kennedy in 1962, decided that we should try to support our national security and our economic security into the future by picking a reliable energy source. 40 years ago, 
nuclear power cost half as much as it costs today. And, you know, when solar and wind were more expensive, you know, everybody said, oh, let's do R&D and do everything we can do to bring down the cost of these technologies so they can become more widespread. So it's one thing to make a technology that was never cheap become cheap, but nuclear power used to be relatively inexpensive, and it, it seems like it should be possible to get there again. So we've been doing a bunch of optimization modeling, and if nuclear power was half as expensive as it is today, it would do really well in competing against, say, wind and solar and so on. Uh, and it used to be half as expensive as it is today. And so it seems with some targeted R&D and thoughtful planning and acceleration of construction cycles and so on, you know, there's no reason why nuclear power can't be cost competitive. If you separate out the nuclear technology from the nuclear industry, that's quite a, a useful exercise because a lot of the problems that we have in terms of you know public confidence. So there's two big problems that nuclear has. It's low public confidence and high costs. And those are the two things that I'm basically working on. In terms of the low public confidence, it's a lot to do with having very little trust in the industry, understandably, because the industry, you know, and Malcolm Grimston will speak to this issue, the industry has spent years and years persuading us that it's incredibly dangerous by constantly talking about safety, right? Um, and, you know, the way that the industry has acted on, a, you know, it, even with the best intentions has done very little to actually build public confidence. Um, but we need the technology and we as, you know, nuclear advocates see the potential of the technology because it's uniquely scalable, because of its very small environmental footprint, because of the energy density, essentially. Um, which means that we can produce very large volumes of very clean power with a very small environmental footprint. That's the reason why we support nuclear. And those are good values. And th that, those values is what's attracting more and more people who really care about climate, who really care about protecting nature, who really care about tackling poverty, to enabling all those billions of people in the world that lack access to electricity, to gain access to those modern energy services, and they're looking again at that technology and they're saying, how can we deliver that technology in a different way, in a new way that's, that, that remains true to those values that we have to democracy and um, being accountable and, you know, enabling large you know, numbers of people to sort of have much more engagement and involvement in what's really going on instead of the kind of the old way that the industry has tended to behave, which is elite faceless, unaccountable. And that's, I think, really a big, you know, at the root of where a lot of the public distrust is. And that, you know, is solvable. That's a huge challenge. And we are nowhere close right now to deploying any clean technology at that scale. So we have to think about changing very dramatically the way that we're um, deploying nuclear power stations. and. You know, for the work that I'm doing, that means rethinking not, not the technology itself necessarily, although there are many advantages for moving towards non-light water reactors in terms of reducing, you know, the need for regulatory supervision, in terms of having much more passive safety systems, in terms of consuming spent fuel and so on. And so lots of, you know, recycling. However, stepping away from the technical changes that need to be made, we also need to think about changing the way that we that we build. And that means moving from project-based approach to a product-based approach. And that's really about the, the learning and the productizing of these technologies so that we can actually start churning them out in the way that we do other big complicated machines that are highly regulated, like aeroplanes, for example, or even you know look at the space industry and the progress that's been made even in 10 years in terms of, you know, we can build rockets now that can come back down again and be reused. You know, there's, there's really interesting innovations happening in other sectors that mean that we can build these things more on a production line and have them actually get deployed much more cost effectively. So it's the mindset that needs to change. It's, it's not just technical innovation we need, it's cultural innovation, it's organizational innovation. Now, when you go to get a loan of a, from anybody, you have to uh, pay the interest on that. 
and people always try to calculate the net present value. But if the net present value is all, is calculated not only for what you, uh, what future earnings, and if the future earnings are too far in future, then even a small interest kind of reduces it to zero in today's value. So a lot of the value of the nuclear power that's going to be produced from say 40 to 80 years has basically zero value on the books. And that's a, that's a quirk in our system but it's not recognizing what's the value to the society. It's not a value, it's not a monetary value, I understand that, that that's how the economists and the bankers calculate. But it's, I think, a, uh, if I, I wish I knew und understood the economics and the banking a little, financing a little better, but that's not, <laughs> I don't understand. I just see this as a problem. I see this as a real serious problem that we are not addressing, or we are not adequately taking into account the good that this industry produces in the long run. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's also about like, getting rid of all of this like fake polarization or divisions um, and we've seen that in the UK actually you know quite successfully where we have um, renewables carbon capture and storage and nuclear representatives saying we need all those technologies in order to decarbonize our energy system um, and that's quite a healthy position to be in because actually then we're all really focused on the outcomes that we all care about rather than on the means you know I think within the, the debate we've been confusing the means with the end a lot and you know the particular technology whether it's renewables or nuclear becomes the goal in itself and you know that that actually is not necessarily going to get us to the you know tackling air pollution and tackling climate change enabling millions of people to gain access to energy services outcomes that we all care about. We started Mothers for Nuclear because we realized that um, not only are mothers and women you know, kind of scared of nuclear typically, but there's not very many mothers and women in our industry. It's typically a male-dominated field mm -hmm. and we feel an obligation to get out there and share like other mothers like us should support nuclear. It is the right choice for mm -hmm. combating climate change and lowering air pollution pollution and protecting open space. Women care a lot about different issues. Women care a lot about climate change. Women care a lot about social justice. Women care a lot about making the world a better place for their mm -hmm. children. And so I think um, women have historically been pretty anti-nuclear mm -hmm. because they thought that nuclear was bad for the mm -hmm. environment, bad for the future, bad for their children. But when we learned the truth, we found out it was just the opposite, that nuclear is actually one of the best sources of energy for the environment. It's hope for our future. It's hope for zero emissions and a sustainable um, climate for our children in the future. And so when women and mothers learn that, we think that they'll be some of the biggest advocates for nuclear. Well, as you look at the whole picture, you're not going to get a real idea of why 100% wind and solar power for the world is just not realistic. You could think of different generation technologies as different tools in the toolbox that can help us get electricity when we need it. And you know, if we call for an electrician to come in, uh, you know, we don't want him just to bring a Phillips screwdriver, not a flathead screwdriver, because maybe you'll need a flathead screwdriver to, to fix the problem. And so, you know, us showing up with to solve the climate problem with just Wind and solar it would be like an electrician showing up, leaving half his toolbox at home. And so, you know, we want, you know, when we go to solve a problem, we want to have all the tools at our disposal that we can get. It's using energy that's been stored in uranium by exploding stars billions of years ago. Nuclear power is basically storage using fusion batteries that were charged up billions of years ago by exploding stars. We can extract nuclear power on the moon, on Mars, in space, wherever we want on Earth, uh, and it's not dependent on the environment in particular. Having young kids is a really scary thing. You know, kids don't come with an instruction manual and they ask all these crazy questions that, um, that you're just not prepared to answer. And so the other day, my son asked me, Mom, is the future gonna be better than now? And 
it was such a deep question, you know, to answer it. And I was thinking the first thing that came to my mind was climate change. And I was just so scared for him. You know, what is the future going to look like for you? My name is Mitch Negus. I'm a graduate student researcher here at UC Berkeley studying nuclear engineering. And I grew up in Massachusetts, did my undergraduate study in Massachusetts, focusing on renewable energy, and then switched uh, to nuclear engineering for graduate school. Being a physics major taught me to look at things in the big picture. And so I was working on renewables. I eventually got interested in nuclear fusion. And in the process of getting there, worked on pure nuclear physics with no energy applications and that led me to learn more about nuclear fission. I find nuclear energy exciting because it's such an energy dense form of power. That energy density was really appealing to me as sort of a great place to look for a solution to energy problems and uh, in particular coming up with clean energies that can be used to prevent climate change and remove our reliance on fossil fuels. So I ended up in this space, I went to undergrad to study mechanical engineering and there I really got interested in thermodynamics and power systems and making electricity and power for people and from that I ended up thinking and understanding that nuclear energy was really interesting, really complicated and complex, sort of endlessly fascinating, but it also has an extreme potential to provide energy and power to society, not just today, but into the future for a long time. And that got me really excited about nuclear power, particularly fusion at first, but then I understand it as an engineer, advanced fission is probably where I want to be working. So. I got into nuclear because I went to Germany and there they didn't like nuclear, so it was really easy for me to get involved in the nuclear community because everyone was international. Uh, and basically that changed my life and I totally changed course and ended up deciding I wanted to do grad school, get into nuclear, um, and now here I am. My interests in life were always just what can I do to make the biggest impact. Um, I've always wanted to do something that was significant not just to me but that would help people, uh, otherwise what's the point? And so. I didn't arrive at nuclear because I thought nuclear was cool. I arrived at nuclear because I wanted to look at the options and see what's the best way to do this. And nuclear seemed like the clear thing that really needed something different. Um, and so that's really what I focused on. It was a total change from what I originally wanted to do. And I think that it is the biggest thing we need to work on um, to mitigate climate change and the public health concerns from fossil fuels. Nuclear to me had the most um, had the most fundamental physics behind it, which is interesting to me as a physicist, and so that's kind of why I joined the space. 